service. We're going to commence now with our time of praise. And the first one we're going to sing is, His name is wonderful. We read in Isaiah 9, verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And then it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. His Name is wonderful, his name is Lord. Let's sing us through this evening. me the story of Jesus right on my heart every word tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard
next one we're going to sing. There is a story sweet to hear. I love to tell it to you. It fills my heart with hope and cheer. Tis old yet ever. And yes, let's sing this praise unto the Lord this <clears throat> evening. sing those old hymns. Let's sing this next one. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace in the mountains, bright and blessed. He's prepared for us a place.
day that's going to be when we all see Jesus. We're going to stand now for our opening hymn and after the introduction. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Let's sing our opening hymn this evening. Let's praise to the Lord. Now let's just come together quietly as we bow in God's presence for prayer. There's no one loves us like the Savior does. And we're grateful for him. We long that others might come to know him. Let's just pray for God's help and for his blessing. Our God and our Father, very quietly and humbly, we bow in your holy presence tonight on this, another Lord's Day evening. We come to you, our Father, acknowledging that you are our God, that you are the one who loved us with an everlasting love and one who loved us so much that you sent your Son into the world to be our Savior. Father, we thank you that many of us have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and through him 
we have now know the knowledge of sins forgiven. And we're so thankful that because we are in him and united to him and belong to him, that we can come just now at the attitude of prayer right at the commencement of our meeting. We can give you our thanks and our praise for the son of your love, for Calvary and all that it means to us, for the empty tomb and all that it reminds us of, and the fact that many of us who know and love the Savior tonight sitting in this meeting can look forward to that day when we shall see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face. We come, our Father, and we thank you for the earlier part of today. We thank you for our fellowship together, for the time we spent around the Lord's table. And we thank you, our Father, for the great blessing that the Lord's day is to the Lord's people. Father, thank you for making provision for everything that we have had need of today. And thank you even for bringing us out again tonight that we might fellowship the one with the other. Father, we ask your blessing upon every head bowed in your presence just now. Father, we thank you that you know each one of us, you know our needs, you know everything that is to be known about us, things even that others know absolutely nothing about. And we're glad that we're able to commend ourselves to you. We ask our Father that you would draw near to us. We pray that you would warm our hearts afresh, that you would encourage us where we're down, that you would enlighten us where we're still lost in our sin. And we pray, our Father, as we commend our meeting to you, that it might please you by the power of the Holy Spirit to move amongst us to speak also to each one of our hearts. Thank you for every head bowed here. Thank you for every home that is represented. Thank you, Father, also for those who are joining us live on Facebook. We thank you for their fellowship, and we pray that you would bless them in their own homes tonight or wherever it is that they're joining us from. Father, we thank you that this is the day that the Lord has made. And we thank you there's something special about the Lord's day, and we thank you so much that we're able to fellowship together in spiritual things around your word. So we just commend ourselves to you. We think also, Father, of everywhere else tonight where the Word of God will be preached. We thank you that you're not restricted to any building. We bless you, our Father, that there are those who are preaching the gospel and sharing their faith in other places too. And we ask that God would bless everywhere across our province where the Word of God will be preached. For those who testify, for those who minister in song, we pray that the Spirit of God would help them. Father, we live in days when a land like ours needs the Savior. And so we pray that many will come to know him tonight in different places and all for the glory and the honor of your great name. Bless those who'd love to be with us, but they can't for various reasons. Think of those, our Father, who are laid aside. Think of those who grieve tonight. And again, we commend Jane to you, Adam, Cherry, the whole wider family circle, and ask that God would be with them in these days. We think of others in our fellowship likewise who have had to pass through times of difficulty recently because death has entered their homes. And for them we pray, and for all we pray, who have had this experience recently, that God in his grace would draw near to them and minister to them. So hear our prayers as we come to you just now. Bless the remainder of our time together and use this, we pray, for our good. And grant our Father, when the day comes to a close, we'll look back with gratitude and we'll praise you for the help that you've given and for the blessing that you have been to us, and we ask it all in the Saviour's precious name. Amen. Amen.
Could I take this opportunity to welcome you all to our evening gospel service at Banbridge Baptist Church. We welcome those who will be tuning in live on Facebook this evening. And if you're visiting with us tonight, we give you a special welcome. May we know the blessing of the Lord as we fellowship in his presence this evening. Just a wee word that the pastor is going to be speaking on tonight. I was thinking about it today, and it was a passage that was spoken to me by Pastor David Simpton 27 years ago in Luke 21. And that was the passage that brought me to understand that I was lost in my sin, and it helped me to give my life to Jesus. So it is my prayer tonight that the word of God that the pastor is going to share tonight will find a resting place in someone's heart this evening. Just the announcements for the incoming week. On Tuesday, the toddler group at 10.30 a.m., then on Tuesday evening, the Ladies' Fellowship at 8 p.m., and that is titled Can't Cook, Won't Cook, and they will have Johnny, Chef Johnny, and wannabes Ivan and Ian, and they'll be coming uh, to look at that. So an exciting night for the ladies, uh, so you're all very welcome to that. And Pastor Taylor will be bringing a closing message. Then on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study, uh, we're now finished with Exploring Ephesians, and Pastor Taylor will be beginning a new series called The Ships of scripture then on friday the bible study at 12 15 p.m with their elder woody price and then on friday evening it's the baptist ladies night with jenny mclaughlin and that's at 7 30 p.m at, ba at porter down uh, baptist church and just the ladies we plan to attend as a group can all ladies wishing to join us meet outside porter down baptist church at 7 p.m anyone requiring a lift if you could please speak to christine then the next lord's day sunday school and church services running at the usual times. The children's talk will be Letitia MacDonald. Children's church will be Woody and Elaine Price. And children's crash will be Valerie and Arne Bell and Rita Lindsay. The evening service will be the annual Arch Purpose, or Purple Service. And the singers at that meeting will be the Lockhart family. Pastor Taylor will be speaking at both services next Lord's Day. Just another night, Baptist Missions are having a night on Tuesday the 14th of May and that's at Balna Hinch Baptist. The main program starts at 7.30 p.m., but there will be a pre-service catch-up at 7 p.m. I think that's also available online as well. Then the Ladies Walk for Life, that's on the 14th, the 21st, and the 20th of May, meeting each night at 7 p.m. at the church, and that's for all abilities with refreshments and short talk afterwards. If anyone has been spoken to over these last weeks or months about baptism, our church membership, if you could please speak to Pastor Taylor or one of the elders in the coming days. These are all the announcements and they're made subject to the will of the Lord. But before the pastor comes and brings the message this evening, we're going to stand and sing another song, and that is, Was It For Me, For Me Alone?
Now turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, beginning our reading tonight at verse 5. Luke 21, reading from verse 5. Thanks to Mark again for leading us in our time of praise. Let's listen to God's Word, Luke 21 and verse 5. And as some speak of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly stones and gifts, he said, as for these things which ye behold, the days will come in the which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? And what sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that ye be not deceived, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draweth near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not a hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Amen. We'll end our reading there at the end of that particular verse. And we know God will add his blessing to it. Last Sunday night, as we were looking at some verses in uh, Luke chapter 19, we noted that after the Lord Jesus Christ left the city of Jericho and after the conversion of both blind Martimaeus and Zacchaeus, that the Lord Jesus began to make his way towards the city of Jerusalem. He knew what lay ahead of him. He knew that his hour had now come. And he knew that he was heading toward the climax of his ministry here on earth. Every detail of his life was under divine control. And now he must make his way toward the cross. And there he would die for the sin of this old world. And there he would die for your sin and for mine. We've just been singing, was it for me? It was for me, it was for you that the Lord Jesus Christ left the heights of heaven 
to come into this world of sin. It was for all of us sitting here tonight and those listening at home. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And as far as the Lord Jesus Christ was concerned, and on his journey toward Jerusalem, we noted a triumph that would end in tragedy. Luke begins to record for us now that we refer to as the week of passion, days leading up to the Savior's death on the cross. And now Luke begins to record for us some important details about certain events that would take place during that period of time. Last week, remember that we heard the Lord Jesus Christ speak some of the most solemn words that we could ever hear, all concerned with the great city of Jerusalem. It says, when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. And very simply for these people, despite everything that the Lord Jesus Christ had taught, and despite all the miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ has already done throughout his earthly ministry, these people could not be convinced of who Jesus was, and they were blind concerning him and all that he had come to do. The miracles, his preaching, had authenticated to them that he was, in fact, Israel's Messiah, but they didn't understand that. They were blind to the truth, and soon their blindness would turn to hostility. We thought about the Savior's preparation, how as they were going to celebrate the Passover, that Jesus stopped near Bethany. He told the disciples to go to a neighboring village and bring him back a colt, a donkey upon which no one had ever sat because God had reserved it for this sacred use. And of course, this in itself was also a declaration from the Old Testament scriptures in Zechariah 9, verse 9, that this was a fulfillment of prophecy and as the Lord Jesus Christ entered into the city, he was showing to the people again. And again and again we see this in Scripture. And again he was showing them that he was their Messiah. What was happening before their very eyes was a reminder to them of both his deity and his Messiahship, but they just couldn't see. We looked at the Savior's praise. As the disciples with Jesus knew near to Jerusalem, great crowds gathered, began to sing his name, shouted out his name, gave thanks to God for him. But they didn't know who he was. Isn't that amazing? How that people be carried along on the wave when everybody starts to shout, we shout too. And here they're all standing and they're shouting out, thanking God for this man who was in their midst. And they didn't know him. They didn't know why he had come. He had come to deliver them, to save them, to set them free, to give them hope and deliverance, to prepare them for a spiritual kingdom. And they couldn't grasp it. And at that stage, the Lord Jesus Christ told them, having heard their praises and knowing their hearts, he told them of the impending destruction of the city of Jerusalem, a privileged city, a punished city that would soon happen, and a procrastinating city for Jesus said to them, you not, you not the time of your visitation. Wasted opportunities, turning their back on the only one who could save them, rejecting their Messiah, and rejecting the claims of Christ. I hope you don't ever do that. I hope that knowing the gospel inside out, knowing that Jesus Christ is the only Savior for sinners like us, I hope that you will not reject him. Instead, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him 
while he is near. Now tonight, as we pick it up, we're going to look at these verses that Mark has referred to in Luke 21, under the heading, watching the signs and waiting for the Savior. You see, on this occasion, the Lord Jesus Christ is in the temple with his disciples. In the opening verses of Luke 21, we read that lovely story of how Jesus commanded the widow woman for giving everything that she had. She gave her two mites by way of an offering. Not as an outward show, as many do with their riches, but she gave the two mites all that she had out of a willing heart and as a sincere duty to God. And then immediately following that, the Lord Jesus Christ began to speak to his disciples about some very important issues. And these, of course, were prophetic issues. They were inside the temple. And the disciples were taken up with all the externals. They were looking at all its exquisite decorations. They had a materialistic outlook on life. They couldn't distinguish between what was temporal and what was eternal. As Jesus speaks to them, he says that despite the beauty of the temple, that one day it was going to be destroyed. And that destruction would come because it had been defiled. And having heard what Jesus had just said, the disciples wanted to know when all of this was going to take place. They asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be? What sign will there be when these things shall come to pass? Do you note here that in response to the questions that the disciples asked Jesus, he began to talk to them about the end times. He speaks about his second coming. And here in Luke 21, we read of things that are essentially connected with the future, but some things that help us to see something that is vitally important, and that is in fulfillment of his promise that the Lord Jesus Christ will one day come again. Now, many people in our society would laugh at the thought of that. They may understand and say, well, yes, I know that he died on a cross, and I know he was buried in a tomb. I'm not so sure that he actually rose again from the grave, but to say that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again is something I cannot understand, nor I would never believe. Well, whether you understand it or you believe it or not, the Lord Jesus Christ said that one day he was coming again. Now remember that these words we're going to think about tonight were spoken knowing Jesus was soon going to the, the cross to die by crucifixion. And while many would be glad to see his death, and while the religious leaders would be glad to see the end of a man that they thought was an imposter, the Lord Jesus makes it abundantly clear, one day he is coming back again. You see, as far as his death at Calvary was concerned, death was not the end for him. He said it is finished. At the last time, he said it is finished. But Jesus wasn't finished. The work that he had come to do on earth was now finished. But Jesus would go to the cross, be laid in a tomb, would be raised again from the tomb, ascend back to heaven, and one day Jesus says, I am coming again. So his death didn't end for him. It certainly didn't end in tragedy. It ended with a promise that Jesus would come again. The world hadn't seen the end of Jesus Christ. In the light of what he said to his disciples, that's why tonight I've used this title, Watching the Signs and Waiting for the Savior. 
You see, the signs tonight that Jesus gives relating to prophetic things just don't have to do with our present day, but days that are yet to come. The watching is for all of us because if we are saved tonight, we ought to be watching and waiting and looking heavenward, knowing that at any time the skies could break and Jesus might come. And if we're not saved, then we need to be ready. We need to get saved. We need to make sure that we are ready to meet the Lord Jesus when he comes. Now, I know the second coming of Jesus Christ is a vast subject causes much debate amongst Christians who hold different views, and that's okay. What I'm going to do tonight is to see what Jesus says about his own second coming. Five things. We're not going to do them all, of course, in the time we've left, but we're going to take our time to do this, and there are five things that I want to mention from this passage. First of all, there is the destruction of the temple. Now, we must remember again, the background to all of this is in the context of the Savior's approaching death. And here as the disciples meet with him, they're pointing out to Jesus the beauty of this temple that they're in. Now, we need to understand that this temple was a very elaborate structure. It was referred to as Herod's temple because it had been started by Herod about 19 to 20 BC. Herod had altered it. He had enlarged the complex. It was of great significance to the Jews. It was a vast complex, beautifully adorned, and remember that it was central to the religious life of the people. It was a most impressive building. And not only that, but it was also one of the wonders of the ancient world. The walls were marble. Inside the temple were some very special gifts, a table from Ptolemy of Egypt, an expensive chain from Agrippa, a golden vine from Herod. This was a beautifully adorned place described by historians as a shrine of immense wealth. And into the background of all of this, as these disciples are looking around the temple and looking at all the exquisite decorations and looking at everything that was there, Jesus steps into the conversation. And he says this to them in Luke 21, verse 6. As for those things which ye behold, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now already we have noted how that Jesus had reminded them about the city. And Jesus had wept over it because they couldn't see the destruction that was soon to befall them, but Jesus could. And he knew about its impending judgment. And now Jesus speaks to his disciples and he speaks about a day that is yet to come when the temple itself, with all its beauty and with all its glory, is going to be completely destroyed. You see, its outward beauty mattered not. Its symbolism and all its rituals mattered not. The day was soon coming when great destruction would come upon this privileged city, the temple would be destroyed, and what Jesus said to the disciples of this occasion would eventually come to pass. You say, how do you know that? Well, because when the Jews rebelled against the Romans, the temple was destroyed. It's said by historians that thousands and thousands of Jews had crowded into the city and into the temple, and every single one of them perished at the hands of their enemies. And their doom came at last, just as the Lord Jesus Christ had said. Is it any wonder that the Lord Jesus Christ 
cried. He wept over the city. But the problem for the people, they couldn't see this. They didn't understand it. They didn't even recognize Jesus, and therefore they rejected his word, and they would be destroyed. I think we need to pause there for a moment. You see, just as those people in Jesus' day didn't understand the solemnity of their day, so too many people in our world are in exactly the same place for a different reason. Let me explain it like this. What befell the city of Jerusalem and Herod's temple will one day befall this whole world in which we live. You may not accept that. You may even laugh at such a suggestion. You may see, but look at our world tonight. Isn't it a beautiful place? I've been here, I've been there, and I've been all over the place. I tell you this, there's a day coming when God's going to deal in judgment with the world in which you and I are living just now. And you know what it says about this? The Bible says that God has appointed a day when he will judge the world. But many people tonight are just like the Jews of Jesus' day. It'll never happen. I don't believe it. Everything I know about God is centered on God's love and his grace and a God of great compassion. I don't believe for one moment that God is going to one day judge this world. Well, whether you believe it or not, and whether you scorn what the Bible says or not, doesn't matter. The Bible says God has appointed a day when he will judge the world. And it goes on to say, by that man whom he has ordained. In other words, God warns us in his word that one day his grace will be no more. That one day his wrath will be poured out in great measure upon our world. And great will be the destruction. You know, the Apostle Paul puts it even more solemnly. When writing to the Christians at Thessalonica, where he again dealt with the Lord's return in each chapter of that first letter, the Apostle Paul put it like this. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. Who shall be punished? with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Those are solemn words. And those are sad words. But we need to grasp them. Because men and women tonight are trifling with their souls. They're engaging in sin without a care in the world. You say to me, how do you know that? Take a look at the world in which we live. Listen to the news every day. Listen to the horrible things that are taking place. And you tell me that this world is not ripe for judgment. God in flaming fire will one day take vengeance upon those who know not Christ those who refuse to believe the gospel. You say to me, oh yes, I understand, John, where you're coming from. And I know that the world isn't in a good place at the moment. But you know, I believe that things will only get better. Do you really believe that? How can they get better? When God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man whom 
he has ordained. And on that day when God deals with sin and God deals with the sinner, the only refuge that we have from coming judgment is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the gospel is preached. That's why the gospel is centered upon him. That's why the Lord Jesus will be preached in so many pulpits tonight across our land and further afield because Jesus Christ is the only hope we have. And in the light of coming judgment, we do well to know him as our saviour. We need to be sure that our sins have been cleansed in his precious blood. We need to make sure we have been to the cross by faith. Because the Lord Jesus Christ is the only hope we have. The words of the hymn by Charles Wesley makes it very clear. He says, other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, I leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stead. All my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. What's he saying? He's saying that the Lord Jesus Christ is the only refuge for our soul. And on that terrible day, whenever the waves of God's wrath are poured out upon the world in which we live, will you and I be found in him? Because if not, there's no place to hide. And there's nowhere to flee from the awful wrath that is yet to come. And that's why I say to you that if you're not saved tonight, turn from your sin and trust the Savior. And do it while the door of God's mercy is opened and before you're carried away in the tides of God's wrath. There is the destruction of the temple. Secondly, there's the deception of the false Christ. Let me do this very quickly. In the light of this warning about the temple and the coming destru destruction upon the world, the disciples asked this question. They said, Master, when shall these things be? And what sign shall there be when these things shall come to pass? And in regard to that question, Jesus gave them some signs. And he warned them to make sure, first of all, that they weren't deceived. They weren't deceived. There are people all over our world tonight in the religious realm that are being deceived. They're being deceived because they're not being told the truth. They're being deceived because the message that they hear says nothing about the cross. They're being deceived because they're told that heaven awaits them, but they're not prepared. There are people tonight who are being deceived right now while we meet here. He said there were those who would be deceived by those who would come and set themselves up as the Messiah, claim his power, claim his authority, and in doing so, they would lead many astray. Now, personally, I see this as a twofold application. Firstly, in this present day, this is already happening. We already have a number of years ago, a young boy of 12 claiming to be the Messiah brought all around the world to all the countries of the world, and now where is he? Nobody knows. We have a sports commentator, David Icke, a number of years ago on television being interviewed, claiming he was God's Messiah. Where is he? Nowhere to be found. 
And in this present day, Jesus says, look, many have been deceived. Many are being deceived. And in these closing days of grace, leading up to the second coming of Christ, we can expect to see this happen time and time again. But you know, secondly, in a future day, this will all come to fruition with the coming of the Antichrist. Now, I know that many of God's people have different views. We're all entitled to them. But this is how I see it. As far as the Antichrist is concerned, he's the one referred to in Scripture as the prince that shall come, or the man of lawlessness. He'll oppose God. He'll exalt himself as God. He will seek to receive worship. He'll enter into a covenant with the nation of Israel. He'll break that covenant, and then he will gather together the kings of the earth to Armageddon to make war. But even he will be destroyed by the appearing of Jesus Christ at his second coming. But Jesus says to the disciples, look, don't be deceived. Do not go after these false Christs. Many of us today should take note of that. A world where there are so many false prophets, counterfeit Christianity, we need to be alert to all that's happening around us, lest we be deceived. You see, beloved, there are all kinds of groups raising their heads, peddling so-called truth. There are all kinds of cults standing on the street corner, calling at our doors, claiming to have the truth, and they're deceiving people. And some of the best good-mannered, good-living people in our society are being deceived. So many have been taken in by people like this who have the truth, but they don't know the way to heaven. They don't know the way to heaven. There is no other way to heaven but through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Now underline that in your mind, if not your Bible. We must be saved. We must be saved. Because if we're not saved, then we're lost. There's no other way about it. There is no middle ground. We must be saved, the Bible says. And if we're not saved, we'll be lost. You see, whenever it comes down to it, despite all the objections to the gospel and all that's propagated by so many people today who claim to be men and women of God. The only hope for time and eternity is found in the living Christ of God. The only way we can be saved and sure of a place in heaven is to have our faith in Jesus Christ who died for our sins at the cross who rose again that we might be justified in God's sight and who is coming again to take us home to heaven, to be with him. Oh, I know and I've met them. And people will say, I think you're being a little bit too restrictive. There are many ways that men and women today can get to heaven as far as salvation is concerned. Well, I'm not interested in what they say, but I will listen to what Jesus says. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Do you know, today people can talk about their church, about creeds, about good works, 
And we could argue about all of these things until the day that we slip out into eternity. And they'll matter nothing. Absolutely nothing. For when we slip out into eternity, we'll realize then what we should realize now. There is one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. We bypass the cross, we'll never be in heaven if we reject Christ as our Savior, then we will never be saved. You might say, Pastor, that's a terrible thing to say. Well, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. And that's why we need to heed it. There's the destruction of the temple, the deception of false Christ. Next time together, we'll look at the despair of the people. We'll look also at the disasters in our world. And then we'll conclude with the deliverance of his own. Let's pray together as we leave it there tonight. Father, we come to you and we thank you that we have the blessed hope within our souls that one day Jesus is coming again. And Father, we long in knowing that, that we would be alert, awake, and busy, trying to make the gospel known in a day when there is so much deception all around us. Father, we want that people would understand their plight, and we want that they would prepare to meet God. So help us as your children to be busy in the work of evangelism. Maybe some listening tonight not yet saved. Father, we pray that they will come to know the Savior. They realize there is no other Savior but him who died that we might live and who lives tonight that we need never die. Help us as we try to understand your word in the light of all that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ said, and help us to make our preparation for glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together in closing. There is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son, Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One.
Thank you, Father, for sending your Son into the world to be our Savior. Thank you for the great salvation that we have in him, the blessing that it is to live for Christ and to walk with God, and the joy and blessing of one day standing in his presence, saved by grace, rejoicing in all that he accomplished for us at the cross. Father, we pray that others who don't know him will show a sense of urgency and seek the Lord Jesus Christ while he may be found. We pray that if judgment is coming to our world, we pray that they will close in with God's offer of mercy, that they might be found in Christ alone, for outside of him we have no hope. Bless us as we part the one from the other. Take us to our homes in safety. Watch over us this week, we pray. And Father, we ask that we'll be conscious of your leading, of your presence, and of your blessing upon these hearts and homes of ours. Hear our prayers. Take us safely home. We pray tonight in the Savior's precious name. Amen. Amen.